Today we're going to start to talk about the Laplace transform. Before we do that, it's going to be important for us to do a quick review of improper integrals, since, as you'll see on the next page, the Laplace transform is defined entirely in terms of improper integrals. So, what do we mean when we write the improper integral, the integral from a to infinity f of x dx? Of course, it's improper because infinity there is not a number. When we mean pro when we talk about a proper integral, we just mean a regular definite integral where you have a function f which is continuous, say, on a closed interval from a to b. Here, when we have an infinity there, we mean by definition that this will be the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from a to t of f of x dx. So you just compute these definite integrals and you ask what happens as this upper limit t gets larger and larger and larger as t tends to infinity. Let's look at a couple of really quick examples. These are things I'm sure you've seen in your Calc 2 classes. How would we compute the integral from 1 to infinity of e to the rx dx? Well, this is, we start just by definition, the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of e to the rx dx. Then we just compute this integral. So we're not taking a limit yet, so we have to leave that there. The limit of, how do we compute this? That's just 1 over r e to the rx evaluated from 1 to t. That's just a limit as t goes to infinity of e to the rt over r. And I should notice note here that this as long as r is not 0. If r is 0, things look very different. So this is the limit as t goes to infinity of e to the rt over r. That's plugging in the t. And then we have to subtract. Uh, let's see, I have 1 here. So that would be e to the r over r. Now, what can we say about this limit? Well, if r is any positive number, this whole thing blows up. If r is equal to 0, then this is just 1 over r minus e to the r. And that's fine. That would be a nice finite number. So it's equal to 1 over, I'm sorry, r equals 0. Not r equals 0. If I, r can't equal 0, and let's look at different values of r. If r is greater than 0, we have infinity. We're not allowing r equal 0 because that 0 is in the denominator. What if r is negative? If r is negative, e to the rt tends to 0. And then this is just exactly minus e to the r over r. Of course, r is negative, so this is a positive quantity. This is when r is less than 0. In other words, this limit only makes sense. The limit only con converges when r is a negative number. And that should make perfect sense here, because if r is negative, then this function e to the rx tends to 0. And we get an interpretation here. And I'll draw the picture up here of e to the rx. Here, r is negative as a function that decreases, and the integral from 1, here's x, here's 1, the integral from 1 to infinity of e to the rx can be interpreted as the total amount of area underneath the graph of the function e to the rx from 1 all the way to the right. What can we say about the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p? dx. Well, we'll talk about that in the case where p is not equal to 1. It's a good exercise for you to uh, do that in the case where p equals 1. Again, uh, we'll take a limit as t goes to infinity of just the integral from 1 to t of, I'll write that as x to the minus p dx. And as long as p is not equal to 1, we have a formula for the antiderivative of x to the minus p, and that's just 1 over 1 minus p times x to the 1 minus p, now evaluated from 1 to t, which is, when we plug in t, a limit as t goes to infinity, of we'll have t to the 1 minus p over 1 minus p minus 1 over 1 minus p.
Now, if p is bigger than 1, then t to the 1 minus p is t to a negative power, and in the limit as t goes to infinity, that goes to that limit, that part is 0. And so what you'll have is just this part, which is 1 over p minus 1. That's when p is bigger than 1. If p is less than 1, again, we're eliminating the case where p equals 1, then we have t to a positive power here, and that limit will be infinite. And notice this will be positive, so we'll get plus infinity as the limit. And this is something you've all probably seen, that a function 1 over x to the p, this improper integral will converge exactly when p is greater than 1. I'll leave you guys to check on your own what happens when p equals 1. You'll see that this improper integral diverges. And remember, we say the integral diverges when this limit doesn't exist. Here's one final example just to play with improper integrals. How do we integrate from 2 to infinity 1 over x log squared x? Well, that's just a limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 2 to t of 1 over x log squared x dx. Now, in order to evaluate this integral, we'll let, say, u be log x. Then, of course, du is 1 over x dx. And we see the 1 over x dx here. So this integral becomes an integral of the 1 over x dx is du. And we have 1 over u squared. And then we have a limit as t goes to infinity. Don't forget to change the limits. u is log x. These are values for x equals 2 and x equals t. So u goes from log 2 to log t. And now we just evaluate this integral. So limit as t goes to infinity of the integral of 1 over u squared du, which is, what is it, minus 1 over u from log 2 to log t. That's the limit as t goes to infinity of minus 1 over log t, then plus 1 over log 2. And as t goes to infinity, this tends to 0, so the answer will just be 1 over log 2. Once you're comfortable with improper integrals, then it will make sense to make this definition. The Laplace transform, which we'll write with a script or a calligraphic L here, a script L, f of t dt, the Laplace transform of a function f, whose variable is t, will be denoted by capital F of the variable s. Note that that's a different variable. And it's defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of this part here, which we call the kernel of this integral transform. That's the e to the minus st part, multiplied by f of t dt. So notice here, t is the variable of integration. When we integrate t from 0 to infinity, we'll be left with a function of s. And so that's why the Laplace transform of a function of t will be a function of a different variable. We're just calling it s, just as a convention here. And of course, this Laplace transform will only make sense as long as this improper integral converges. So here's a question. How can you know if such a thing will converge, and how can we compute Laplace transforms? Well, a theorem tells us it's not too difficult to prove this, but we won't be going through every detail here, that if you have a function f of t, which is defined in piecewise continuous on any interval of the form 0 to a. So let me just try to draw a picture here. So we start at 0. If you go all the way out to, say, capital A, if it's defined and, continu and piecewise continuous, so we're going to allow functions that are discontinuous. Piecewise continuous means it's continuous except for a finite number of jump discontinuities. Maybe the graph will look like this. So if it looks like this, if the graph of f, y equals f of t, this should be our t-axis and our y-axis. You see this is a piecewise continuous function. No matter what a is, it's still piecewise continuous. And even if it had a lot more jumps, 
as long as for any number a it's only a finite number of jumps before a, it's still called piecewise continuous. If that's true, and f doesn't grow too quickly, the absolute value of f must be bounded by some function, some exponential function, e to the at here. A can be any real number, and we can put in a constant there if you like. K would be a positive constant, and it just needs to be bounded by a function like that eventually for all t greater than or equal to m. Then the claim is that this Laplace transform of f exists at least whenever s is bigger than a. And the basic reason that this works is if the function f, at least in its absolute value, is no bigger than a constant times e to the a t, say a is 7, so it's bounded by e to the 7 t, when you multiply that by e to the minus s t, as long as s is bigger than 7, you'll have f, which is no bigger than a constant times e to the 7 t, and say if s is 8, you'll have an e to the minus 8 t here, that will tend to 0 exponentially, and like an exponential function, and then this integral will certainly exist. That'll be true any time that this number s is bigger than the a which bounds the behavior of f. If f is a function which grows faster than any exponential function e to the at, then it should be clear that this integral won't make sense because if f grows faster than any exponential function, then this integrand will not tend to zero and there'll be no hope of convergence. So everything we're doing with Laplace transforms will only apply when you have functions that have no worse than exponential growth. Now that covers most functions that are of interest, but not every function we use in mathematics. So just be careful that you don't try to use the Laplace transform on a problem where you have functions that grow faster than any possible exponential function. You'll have to use other techniques for such differential equations.